Right. We're definitely going to get our step counting going up, <laughs> up and down today. <laughs> so, um, Anna, thank you so much for being with us today. But before I ask you my seriously highbrow intellectual uh, interview questions, um, tell us a bit about yourself, uh, who you are, where you live, a bit about your life. Hi, I'm Anna, and it's great to be with you here today. I have come from Burford in Oxfordshire, and there's a lovely group or so of you who have come from there, so thank you very much. And my husband is Tom, and he is a vicar. And we have been in Burford now for about four years. We moved up from Somerset, another lovely group from my old church, yeah, <laughs> have come from there today too, which is great to have everyone here. Um, and I have three children from 13 down to six, and the majority of my time is spent with them and looking after them. The slightly worrying thing is Tom and I were at university together 20 years ago, but I am only 20, yeah. so I'm like, how is this possible? <laughs> it wasn't 20 years ago, no. Um, now, here are our favourite questions. Um, which film, TV or book character do you most identify with? Uh, yeah, so the, I don't identify with anyone wholly, but probably um, it, it would be the kind of the pride and prejudice one yeah. for all the good and the bad reasons. I recognise that there's a lot of the kind of the prejudice and the judgmental, but also the kind of feisty, yeah, go for it, kind of a girl attitude, yeah. And uh, would you rather be chased by one duck the size of a cow or a herd of cows the size of a duck? Okay, so we live in like rural Oxfordshire where we do walk through fields with cows and they are big. So I think I'm going to have to go for the, the cows the size of ducks because a duck the size of a cow would just be like huge. <laughs> and if you had a superpower, what would it be? Um, I think invisibility. I, I, I was tossing up invisibility or flying, but invisibility I'd quite like to just... Uh, for people not to see me sometimes, which is strange standing right up here in front of a whole group of people. But yeah, invisibility. I think that is a great one to have with kids at home because yes. if you're just asleep on the sofa, they don't know. <laughs> um, where is your favourite place in the world? Uh, now, this is tricky. So I really like sunshine and heat, which just doesn't really happen in this country. So I do like to go abroad and sit on a, uh, on a beach, but that doesn't happen often. So in this country, I love the Lake District. We go up to the Keswick Convention every year, and I love the beauty of the hills and the lakes and just the freedom and feeling like you're away from everything and in the countryside. I love that. Now, although you do live in the Cotswolds, mm. right now you're here southwest yep. where a centuries old debate continues to rage do you put clotted cream on your scone first and then the jam or do you do jam and then the clotted cream scrap the butter no one is interested in the yeah, butter. No, no butter great okay so i'm with you on the butter i definitely put the jam on first and then the clotted cream on top so sorry if half of you have already switched off from listening to me but that's it that is absolutely the correct answer. Oh, good, good. Anything she says today from up here, <laughs> you can trust. Not the truth. <laughs> but in all seriousness, why have you chosen to speak to us today from One Peter? Yeah, so we did, um, there was a series of talks on this at my church uh, about a year or so ago, and um, I have just loved the richness and the depth of 1 Peter. It is, there's so much in this really small book. And as I've been looking at it and studying it to bring to you today, I have been just struck afresh again myself about the messages of 1 Peter and just fixing my eyes on the hope that is to come and the difference that that makes to every aspect of my life. So I'm hoping that that will help you all in whatever walks of life you're in today too. Thank you. Great. Well, we will pray for you now before. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Anna and for Tom. Thank you for the work of grace you've done in their lives. Thank you for bringing them to know you and love you. Thank you for their children and thank you for the life you've called them to in Burford right now. We pray for your blessing over them. Thank you so much for the work you've done through Anna in preparing the talks today and how you've also been working and changing her heart as she reads and prepares. Please help us here now have hearts that are ready to hear and willing to change for your glory. Amen. I think Amanda is going to bring us our reading, right? And then we'll go straight into your talk. Our first reading this morning is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 12, helpfully located on page 5 in your conference booklet. So 1 Peter chapter 1, 
verses 1 to 12. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets, who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Well, great. And um, thank you very much for having me here. It is wonderful to be with you all this morning. And as I get started, I wanted just to introduce you to a few friends of mine who would all say that they have a faith. Firstly, we have Jane. She is a lovely older lady who has raised her family in the faith. She's widowed and she feels the pain of loneliness. She has been long in the faith, but if she's honest, her faith has become a bit flabby. She's a bit blasé about it and uh, a bit complacent about resisting temptations. And compromises have begun to creep in around the edges. And she believes that Jesus died for her sins, but the joy has left her. Or Lucy, who is a 30-something singleton, who too has known the pain of loneliness, of friends moving on, and the uncertainty of life decisions about work and where to live and having to make them all on her own. While she is content to be single, the loneliness really bites and she's recently been tempted to find a partner who does not share her faith. Or Sarah. Sarah's got two young boys and she has recently returned to work uh, where she's quickly gained a promotion and she has been buoyed um, at seeing the response of those around her to doing a job well. Her days are full 
with work and taking the boys to extracurricular activities. And now she has the extra income. She's got the new boots and coat of the season. She's well turned out. They've had the extension and the home improvements they always wanted to. And she treats the family to the holidays her friends have always had. None of this is inherently wrong. Let me be really clear about that. But somewhere along the way, Sarah started to be tempted to live for the here and the now, to invest in this world and its promises and pleasures, to hope in the next holiday or promotion to give her peace. And when the boys start to ask about going to rugby on a Sunday morning instead of church, where she would previously not have entertained the idea, she now finds herself starting to find a ways around it. Or maybe if I took them this week and the husband took them next week, then we'd only miss every other one. Peter has a message for those who are doing well in this life as well. Well, how about Amy? Amy has had a rough few years. She's had operations and a diagnosis of cancer which thankfully was able to be removed. Recently, her children have been really struggling and she's found out that all three of them have neurodivergency, a combination of autism and ADHD that is going to make um, interactions with this world difficult at best. One is currently out of school and much of her time is spent as a carer. In the face of sufferings, of trials, of long-term pain in everyday life, she's tempted to despair and struggles to praise God in whom she has placed her trust. I wonder if you know someone like one of my friends, or perhaps you see yourself in one of them. Have you found yourself living for the next good thing? If only I had this, or hoping for a change of circumstances as a way out. If only this would happen, then things would be okay. Or perhaps you're someone for whom everything is okay, really. Life is just chugging along as per usual. You dutifully go to church, read your Bible, pray, serve on a couple of rotors maybe, and things are fine. But maybe you'd like for things to be more than just fine. Maybe you yearn for a spark, a joy, a living hope that can impact your life more than just a dry duty that things have become. Or maybe for you, this world has been front and center for a number of reasons now, and heaven feels like a very long way off. Well, Peter tells us that if we keep this world in focus, we will always be left disappointed. Instead, we need to look ahead to the promise of all that's to come. I'm sure many of us know this in theory, but I am so easily brought back to this world. If we did this, then we'll be happy, joyful full of praise to the God that gave us this. Well, Peter urges us to place our hope instead in the things God has already done, the inheritance kept in heaven for us that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Only then will we be able to take heart, be of good cheer, and praise God, even through trials, because of that hope. So I'm going to spend a bit of time thinking about the idea of hope before we delve into this passage in 1 Peter. Because hope is a fundamental to life. Without hope, all that's left is despair. Um, in the concentration camps of the Second World War, there were brutal physical conditions. But the survivors say the thing that was the worst was when the, there was loss of hope. And that was what led people to degeneration, to wasting away, to giving up. Because hope allows us to look to the future. And in so doing, it provides a reason for living today, a focus, a significance to one's actions. That's why hope is so important and foundational for existence. But what we choose to put our hope in is what forms our identity and informs the way we live our lives each day. Those without a Christian worldview may be tempted to think of hope more as wishful thinking, I hope that something will happen, fingers crossed. Have a look at some of these quotes from popular culture. We've got uh, Leanne Womack says, and when you get a chance to sit it out or dance, I hope you dance, I hope you dance. Or uh, John Lennon, this one's more famous than it. You may say I'm a dreamer, I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. 
Maybe you can think of other examples from poems or songs or even conversations you've had where the word hope has been kind of bandied around without the deeper meaning the Bible assigns to it. Because the New Testament speaks of hope, not just as a wishful thinking, but as looking forward without any frustrations or limitations. Imagine that. That is what makes it, in Peter's words, a sure and certain hope. Not a vain, wishful thinking, pie in the sky. Hope's also talked about in the New Testament as a virtue. We find faith, hope and love in 1 Corinthians 13. So to have hope is clearly of great value and something that we should be looking to cultivate. So I hope that today we'll begin to have a think about that hope and leave with a clear idea as to what that hope entails, both for our individual lives, but also how to encourage each other in the hope of the gospel and how we can do that as a body of believers. So if we turn now to 1 Peter, we see that Peter begins his letter by stating who he is, an apostle of Christ Jesus, and then addressing his fellow Christians as God's elect exiles who are scattered. Peter gives great encouragement to hope because of who his readers are. This is the letter of encouragement to believers who are facing persecution, facing the temptations of assimilating to the culture around them, of bowing to the pressures of the world. Sound familiar? And it's easy to see how in the face of this temptation to despair, to lose hope is strong. So three things for us to consider about who we are. Firstly, Peter reminds them they are elect. This theme of being chosen is a recurring one in 1 Peter. We have it again in the very next verse and then later in 2 verse 9 and 5 verse 13. As believers in Jesus, Peter wants to remind his readers that they are God's chosen ones. And with that, to recognise the privileges that comes with that status and standing they have in relation to God. Peter unpacks this theme further in the following verses to 2 verse 10. Because you see, in the face of difficulties, one of the greatest encouragements and sources of hope is in remembering that you, that I, were chosen by God since before the world began chosen to be one of his own and nothing no trials or temptations can change that we as believers as a chosen people together are joined together by something far deeper far greater than the things of this world uh, I have moved around a fair bit in my life um, as a vicar's wife and a vicar's daughter. And one of the great joys of moving around is to go to a new place and to find fellow believers, to find that depth of relationship, of friendship with other Christians. Because our identity as a chosen person and as chosen people is a great encouragement and can give us great hope. But secondly, God's elect are also exiles. Last term at church, we were looking at the book of Daniel, and we were reminded of just what being an exile in Babylon meant for Daniel and his fellow Israelites. They were living in a hostile environment, and it was clear that their true home was elsewhere. So too today, Christian believers need to recognise who we are in relation to the world. We are not in God's place for us. We do not belong here. This world is not our home. Our ultimate citizenship is in heaven. So we will feel weird sometimes. We will be the odd one out on occasions. And we will be the ones that don't fit in. And when we get comfortable with this idea, then the longing for the things of this world fades. The need to compromise in order to fit in will lessen. The desire to find our home, our place, where we can really feel we're known and loved and can belong, does not need to be here. Instead, we can focus on where we know our home is, on where God's place for us is, in heaven, and live instead for the future home. When we lift our gaze beyond the here and the now, and focus on the hope we have to come, 
then the direction of travel towards it becomes really clear. And this too is a theme that is playing out in Peter's letter from 2 verse 11 to 4 verse 11. He's got a whole chunk where he spells out what this would look like in various different situations and scenarios. And it's worth looking at and grappling with how our status as this elect exiles impacts the way we live in relationships, the way we live in work, and the way we live in relation to governments and other things in those chapters. But thirdly, not only are Peter's readers in exile, but they are, unlike the Old Testament Jews, they're also scattered. The people are not gathered together, but isolated, and in need of encouragement from others. And that's why Peter's writing to them. It's lovely today, isn't it, to be gathered together. It's one of the great joys of a women's conference, I find, to be surrounded by like-minded individuals and the feeling of safety and comfort that comes from that. It can be easy to forget that we are scattered exiles and how strange we can feel out there in the world. It's why the church is such a blessing, to gather together some of the scattered to encourage each other as we walk with God. So though we too are scattered across the world, let's not underestimate the privilege, the joy, and the encouragement of gathering together as God's people. Being both God's elect and being in exile undoubtedly leads to tensions and sufferings in the meantime. And it's into this situation that we're gonna primarily be looking at in our sessions today. So even in this first verse, they can see, we can see great encouragements, can't we? reasons for hope. Even the challenges of being scattered exiles can become an encouragement when we realize and make peace with the fact that we don't fit. So remember who we are. We are elect. Remember whose you are. We are God's. Even when we feel like strangers in this world, scattered and separated, different from those around you, take heart, stand firm, and don't be tempted to compromise and assimilate. You have been chosen by God, not because you're special, not because I'm special or especially good, but because he loves his people. He's rescued them to be blessed by them. You are different because you are God's. Well, Peter picks this up in verse two, where we see how the Trinity in its different roles is at work. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. We have a helpful reminder here that we are chosen not because of our own works. No, the obedience comes after the choosing. But instead, we are chosen through the work of the Trinity. What greater encouragement can there be than to know it's not all on me? But more than this, God's chosen people have a purpose, to be obedient to Jesus. That's what we should be doing with our lives. In the meantime, while we wait as exiles in a foreign land, live in obedience to Jesus Christ. Well, what an opening couple of verses, hey? And that's just Peter addressing his readers. And already there is much to be encouraged by. Don't worry, it's going to go quicker through it than just that. So we can take encouragement to have hope because of who we are, God's chosen people, scattered exiles. And as God's chosen people, we're characterized by three things that Peter shows us should make a difference to our lives. He goes on. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter praises God. Do we see that? God's chosen people praise him. It sounds simple, really, doesn't it? Yet how many of us struggle to do so? Maybe because we're in the midst of trials, like my friend Amy caring for her children with additional needs or because we've become dull to the glories of salvation, like my widow Jane, or are discontent at the situation that we're facing threatens to rob us of seeing all that God is doing and all that he is worth praising, like my singleton Lucy. Or maybe it just doesn't cross our minds anymore. 
in the midst of busyness of life, like my working friend, Sarah. Or we become so used to the promises of God that we no longer respond to them with the joy that we once did. Praising God is one of the great delights of gathering together in our churches or on days like today to praise God together, to sing his praises, to be reminded of his truths, and to be encouraged to live that out in our everyday lives. What is it that causes praise to pour forth from Peter's lips? Well, because it was through God's great mercy, his gift, his not giving us what we deserve, but instead bestowing upon us riches that we can have new birth into a living hope. So secondly, as God's chosen people, we can praise him because he has given us new life into a living hope. The metaphor of birth is used lots of times in the Bible, isn't it? And it's a great picture of starting again, of being given a new life, a fresh start. But into what? Well, here Peter talks about into a living hope. A hope that's alive, that's not dull, but shiny. It's not uncertain or a mere possibility, a chance that maybe one day might come true, like Del Boy being a millionaire. No, this hope is alive, a living, very real and certain hope. And we know that it was certain because it was bought with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is how we can be sure of the hope we have because of the resurrection of Jesus. The price was paid. The payment was accepted once and for all. It's a bit like when you do that kind of tap and go with your card, but you have to wait for the approval screen before you can really leave the shop. I've been caught by that before. Um, so if you haven't ever examined or thought about what you think about Jesus and the resurrection, or it's been a while and you've become a bit jaded to it, do take some time to re-examine them. There is plenty of evidence out there for the resurrection and the implications are vast. We're teasing out just one of them today, the one that Peter points us to, that of a living hope. So, as God's chosen people, we can praise God because he has given us a new life that is built on a living hope, a hope that's certain because it's based on the resurrection. But that's not the end of it. No, not only is this new birth into a living hope, but there's also an inheritance in verse 4, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Now, my children are fortunate enough to have four great grandparents alive still. I know, they're very old, but it's brilliant. Tom and I each have two grandparents alive, and it's such a blessing. But at some point, that will change. At some point, they will die, and there will be an inheritance. My granny has already got a system of little coloured dots that she's gone round and put on all the kind of crockery and china and ornaments in her house, yeah. Each denotes which grandchild is going to get which thing. And uh, there's a different story with each kind of set and a different sentimental value that comes with them. But the patterns on these pieces will fade. The stories around them are already, I'm afraid, being forgotten. And if there are no breakages, it will be a miracle. But what's on offer here in 1 Peter is an inheritance that can never perish, can never fade, and will never spoil. In the parable of Matthew 6, Jesus urges his followers to store up for themselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves will not break in and steal. So I guess the question is, what are we living for? Are we living for the treasures of this world? Like my friend, the working mum, Sarah, working for the things of this world, the values, the comfort, and the things the world can bring, the riches of achievements, the joys of wealth or health, all of which can perish, spoil, and fade. Or are we living for the treasures of heaven, for the inheritance still to come? Because not only will that treasure never perish, but both the inheritance and the one who inherits, the believer, are kept. They are secure. 
In verse 4, God keeps the inheritance in heaven for you. It is yours. Your name label is on it. The sticky dot is there. And it's waiting, secure, safe, and ready for you. Not only that, but verse 5, the believer themselves is shielded by God's power. Friends, you too are kept safe, secure, until the time is right for Jesus to return. Until the time has come for you to receive that inheritance in full. Can there be any more guarantee? It's so because it's done by the power of God. Not by some meagre show of faith I might muster up or by the good deeds I might strive to do. And it's not shaken by my misdeeds either. No, it is kept by the power of God. Sisters, we have a hope that's alive. We have a certain an inheritance that is guaranteed. What more motivation do we need to praise God than this? And that's exactly where Peter ends up. In verse 6, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So thirdly, God's chosen people greatly rejoice. The truths of verse 3 to 5 that we've just been looking at remain true no matter what our earthly circumstances might look like, no matter what indicators there might be to the contrary. You see, if our joy is anchored, rooted in these unchanging truths, in this living hope, then it's possible to greatly rejoice even in the midst of grief and trials. Now, here rightly, there will be grief. There will be all kinds of trials. The Bible's realistic about this. We are to expect it. It's not saying that we should plaster on a smile and trot out a few trite sayings through gritted teeth. No, as a group of believers, as a church, there will be trials, and God knows it looks like we might well be facing several of them now. There will be hard times as individuals, but we can have joy in them. My dear friend Hannah, who is in my Bible study group, uh, gave birth to a baby boy last year, and I warn you now, this is sad. Alfred was born, and there were complications. The cord was wrapped around his neck, and he was deprived of oxygen during the emergency C-section. His brain was irreparably damaged, and in the days that followed, his body gradually shut down, organ by organ, until it was only the machines keeping his little body alive. And then Hannah and George had to take the really, really difficult decision to turn off the life support. When Tom and I went to visit them in hospital, there were many tears. There was grief. Real grief, raw grief. There were hugs and there were prayers. The Bible is realistic about grief, sufferings and trials. But note in verse 6, for a little while. You see, when you know that you are a chosen child of God, when you know that you've been given a new life and can have a certain hope and an inheritance to come, when you have that long-term perspective the trials of this life can be described as a little while. Even if it's chronic, lifelong illness or disability or caring for those who are, it's still only for this life. There is a life to come. An inheritance awaits you. And we can have great hope in trials, even joy, because of this new birth the eternal inheritance and because of what it's doing and proving and strengthening our faith. You see, just as an athlete exercises his muscles to strengthen them, or I do it and the twinges kind of prove that my muscles are existing somewhere, so too the muscles of faith are strengthened and proven as they're stretched through trials. You see, Hannah's request to have Tom and I come to the hospital with the bedside of Alfred and pray over him and with her is all the more remarkable if you know that George is not a Christian. If you know that Hannah only came to faith in the previous few years. Her faith has been proved genuine through this. 
She has been at my house for Bible study week in and week out. And the ladies have loved her and rallied round and cared for her and the family. And the church has been the best witness ever to that family. The tears shed have not led to her walking away, but stepping into her faith. Or take Amy with the day-to-day difficulties of caring for her children, of advocating for them and watching them struggle. Okay, I will fess up, Amy is actually me. This is my situation and my children. And the temptation is for my horizons to narrow. So my every day consumed by the here and the now in the difficulties. And it's hard to think that there is any reward to come that could compensate for that. But that's not the way Peter sees it. Instead, it's this tension between the current pressures and the ultimate glory to come that strengthens our faith. Sometimes when life is so obviously beyond our control, our ability to handle it drives us to our knees before the Lord, to ask for strength for the challenges of each and every day. And this is faith. And now how much sweeter is the inheritance as a result of tasting the bitterness of trials? Our inheritance is better because of the difficult times faced. And it's this faith, this trust in God, that's worth far more than any earthly comfort, wealth, health, or achievement. For if we truly believe in an eternal home awaiting us in heaven, then it's faith that will outlast them all. And it's faith that will lead to praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Even though we cannot see Jesus now, we can love him, believe in him, and that does fill us with an inexpressible and glorious joy. That's what it says in verse 7. Again, it's not a placid on smile, a mouth full of trite sayings or even Bible verses trotted out with a deep, but a deep-seated contentment, a security about life, a living hope. That's what biblical joy is. And it's this that will lift us out of any dusty, dry duty of monotonously attending church and reading our Bibles and mean that we don't grumble or feel put upon with the next rotor comes out or someone's asking for more service. We will find instead the good in things. We will serve others with delight, even if it's not seen or acknowledged by those around us. And we can have that kind of joy no matter the circumstances. Think of Horatio Spafford composing that amazing hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, after the loss of his family on their voyage over the Atlantic. Or Helen Rosevere being able to say she counts it all joy after her horrendous ordeals on the mission field. For, verse 9, we are receiving the end result of your faith the salvation of your souls. And that is what matters. That's what's happening and being proven even through difficult circumstances. And it's this salvation that was the hope God designed all along. This is no plan B. It was predicted by the prophets, verse 10. But we have the privilege of living this side of their fulfillment of many of these prophecies, of living after Jesus and so seeing how it all plays out in history. And this is the way God designed hope. Jesus was a suffering Messiah. So when we too go through times of trials, is it any wonder? If Christ suffered, we shouldn't be surprised if his followers do too. So next time, probably in the next break on a conference like this, when you have to introduce yourself to someone and give a kind of potted history about who you are and where you've come from, who are you? What is it that matters to you? What are you living for? What's foundational to your life? As God's chosen people, we are given a new life, and can have a living, certain hope and an inheritance to come. Therefore, we can rejoice and praise God, no matter what circumstances we might be facing. So for Jane, my widower with a slightly flabby faith, 
she can remember that God keeps both an inheritance for her and keeps her to the very end. And she can come back to her first love, Jesus have a hope that is living and a joy that will be obvious to those around her. She can go away from here firm in the faith and lifting her eyes with the hope of the inheritance to come, praising God. For Lucy, my 30-something singleton, no matter the uncertainties surrounding her life, decisions and immediate future, she can take confidence in the sure and certain hope of the future to come. She can be encouraged that she is seen, she is known and loved by someone, by the God of the universe. And she doesn't need to look to compromise in order to find someone to fulfill that need in the here and the now. Or Sarah, my busy working mum, who can put her hope in an inheritance that will last, not in the things of the world around her. She can leave here with a recommitment to focus on that living hope and shed the things around her that distract her or tempt her away from this. She can live with the priorities of faith, including church on a Sunday, and not working for the money for the next desired thing. Or Amy, me, with the ongoing trials, can have a living hope, can remember that there is an inheritance to come and that the trials we are facing can increase our faith, and that will endure. I need to learn to look to God and take the long-term perspective, not hoping in the next doctor's appointment or forms filled in for further support. We can look back at how God has worked in the past, not just in our lives, but in the resurrection of Jesus, and see reasons to praise God not just in the midst of trials, but for the trials. And we too can find joy and not give in to despair or be sucked into the here and the now. We can lift our eyes and praise God and encourage others by the way that we respond to trials. You see, one of the joys of a day like today is spending time with one another, groups from churches and friends meeting up together. And as we think about these verses today, I want us to consider how we can support one another to put our hope in the right place. If we love one another well, if we can share our lives honestly and openly, then a gentle questioning of priorities or loving reminder to look to God rather than other things goes a long, long way. Or maybe we can see this lived out in action in the lives of someone around us. Uh, how about a word of encouragement to that person, to that friend? A word of praise that you see them striving for this, even if it's costly. These things can really mean a lot and make a difference as we seek to help one another along the way. So as I close, as God's chosen people, each of us are given a new life. And we can have a certain living hope and an inheritance to come so we can rejoice and praise God no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for your great mercies on us. We thank you for the gift of new life we thank you for a living hope, a certain inheritance to come. And Lord, we pray that we would be looking to that and living with priorities accordingly. Lord God, we pray that we might rejoice and praise you no matter what circumstances we face today. Amen.